Barbarian Hour, episode one. We got Reese Humphrey. Highlight Humphrey. Yes. Reese, how many people butcher your name and call you Humphreys? Too many. Too many. But no, I don't care, man. So whatever. If they're close, they know more. Uh, they follow wrestling a little bit, and I'm happy with that. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, Highlight Humphrey. Highlight Hump is what I like to call you. Okay. Uh, hump Nasty. The Hump Nasty is the craziest move ever. Yeah. Yeah. Did you get Aaron Pico with the Hump Nasty? It's a Hump Nasty 2.0. That's a little bit different. A little bit different. What did you hit him with? Zeb doesn't follow wrestling. (laughs) What did you you hit him with, though? Hump Nasty 2.0 is what you hit Pico with? It's the 2.0, yeah. That's from the – they two-on-one you. That's where the 2.0 comes in. But the Hump Nasty is from the open. (laughs) That's the difference. (laughs) Did you hit that in Vegas in 2015 against the Mongolian? Mongolian? Uh, I don't know. No, probably. You guys were, <laughs> you remember you guys were just launching each other all over the arena. It was, yeah, crazy. yeah. You remember uh, that match? I do. The arena I, was in, I try, in and block it out. I try and block that one out. What did we end up? 11 11. It was crazy. It was nuts, though. I remember it. Was it the dude? Was it the same guy, uh, Ganzerig, who they threw the fit about in uh, Rio? Different, or guy. Different guy. Different uh, guy. Okay. Uh, I thought it was a different guy. Bowl. That's Ganzerig. He ended up second. Yeah, I wrestled Gonzarig in in France, actually. Same thing. Crazy match. I think I lost to him eight to eight. So that was fun too. I think I was winning eight to nothing though. <laughs> so, Were you winning eight to eight? <laughs> that wasn't good. <laughs> so So when did uh, the highlight name start? I mean, because like right back when uh what the, the throw with Martin on the call. I mean that kind of caught a lot of steam right away. But when when did that name start? I don't know, man. I was just kind of looking at all the people that had the most followers and had the best brands and they all had something that, that wasn't just quite their name. And I uh, started looking at things that started with H and yeah. highlight ended up fitting my, my style of wrestling pretty well. So, I mean, I just, I talked to a few people and then they were like, yeah, I don't know, give it a shot. And then it, it kind of stuck fairly quickly. And, and uh, people that don't know me instead of calling me Humphreys and butchering that they'll just call me highlight that I'll get that in the streets way more often. So, so I'm, I'm not hearing the butchered Humphreys as often as I used to. Nice. Nice. So, you know, I was just listening to an interview with Bryce, uh, Bryce Meredith, Bryce, Bryce is one of your athletes at uh, New Jersey RTC, right? A uh, former athlete. He former just athlete. moved to Phoenix to do MMA full time in the last like couple months. So I'm bummed that, that he's gone. He was definitely one of my best friends still is. Uh, but now he's out in Phoenix and, uh, but I'll still, I still coached him at the HWC open when he wrestled DeSanto. And every time I get a chance to see him, um, that's my boy. He went in on this, this really good interview about branding. And, you know, you're talking about highlight Humphrey, you know, that's a branding, a, a, a great brand that you've built. And obviously a gopher broke maniac style that you have. And he's out here winning these matches. He's making money and he's building a brand. I really hate to see him leave wrestling, but how important is it for these guys to start building a brand? If people want to do it for a living, like how you're doing as a coach, but now these guys are able to do it as an athlete. How important is the branding Reese? It's more important than ever. Uh, the guys who are branding themselves and are actually putting time into creating content are the guys getting picked for these matches. And I'm, I'm really hopeful that these are going to stay around. And I really hope that there's a pro league at some point and we can really have this be sustainable uh, instead of just like a one-time ag on or a pro wrestling league that fades away fairly quickly. I think these are getting the subscribers and they're getting the viewership to keep going. So branding yourself now is, uh, is what's going to make, you get in these matches whether they're here for just now or they stay forever you're going to get more of them which means more money in your pocket means less stress on the rtcs to fundraise for you and it's just going to help grow wrestling the more each athlete grows their own brand it grows wrestling more people want to watch these these events and uh and then hopefully we can start getting the athletes paid what they deserve so how did uh as good a job as anybody yeah. So how this, uh, so let's talk about, right. Your big match coming up, how that transpire, obviously you're getting the eyeballs. Is that kind of, have you been looking at, uh, you know, certain events or kind of this kind of fell on your lap or what happened? Yeah. I mean, I started talking, you know, I, I've, I've trained too much to not want to wrestle somebody. 
Like I, I don't give up too many takedowns in practice and we have some pretty good guys in the room. And, uh, and people ask me all the time, people that wrestle me ask me all the time if I want to compete again. I always said no, but then these money matches started happening. It's like, I can lace them up for three matches. Like I don't, I don't really want to try and make the Olympic team, which is, it's crazy. I'd rather coach to, to, to the Olympic champion route, but these money matches are intriguing because I can lace them up and, and not get in the way of my coaching responsibilities. Coaching is like by far number one for me. Uh, but I do wrestle a lot and I'm beating my body up for what reason, just to be a training partner. Like, uh, I feel like coaching is so much easier when you can show somebody, like if I, if I tell you that to do something it's it's hard to listen at the senior level because everybody's got their own stuff. But when I do it to you five times, you better shut up and listen. Now, now you, you have to listen at that point. So uh, it's like, too, too many times I have to be like, all right, I'm getting in there today. And it just ends up being, I'm in there probably every single day more than I should. Uh, my body feels a little older than it is, but uh, yeah, this match came to me. I, I think I was trying to get into the flow 150 pound bracket. And I just kept tweeting. Cause I, mm -hmm. I thought that was a great opportunity to get in there and wrestle three matches back to back against some of the best guys. Um, but that just kind of started to fizzle away. And I don't know if the spots are taken up. They haven't announced the last four, but it doesn't seem like it's going my way. So uh, Kale Sanderson reached out to me and, or actually David Taylor did in the beginning. And he asked if I want to wrestle Zane. And I thought, well, that's perfect because for me, I'm looking for the, the toughest challenge. I really think I'm maybe the best I've ever been. And, uh, and I wanted the toughest opponent like I, I think a J.O. would be really hard for me to to beat and to wrestle and then a Yanni would be good for me to wrestle and then Zane is actually the worst matchup for me so that's great <laughs> but he's short he's hard for me to get under he's going to be hard to wrestle upper body but uh, I think I've improved in my hand fight like drastically since I stopped wrestling or since I retired and uh, I think that I can hang with them and uh, there's going to be a few key points to the match if I can turn them if I can beat them on the edge of the mat and uh because I, I think I will score I'm pretty confident I'll score but um and then if my defense is as good as I think it is I think I I can beat them uh pretty pretty confident I can win the match I mean if I don't I, I think I'm still an underdog but I think I can win the match and that's why I want to take it and then if I do, hopefully the doors open up to where I can start wrestling more of these matches and help grow wrestling and do my part because I'm still on the mat every day. I might as well lace them up. The weight, you know, I remember the weight seemed to be an issue for you when it was uh, 60 and 61 kilos, right? The weight, 133, that was tough. That was really tough for you to make that weight. Now it's up to 150. You're still really lean at 150. You're probably like 155, probably not cutting much weight or something. Like, I don't mm -hmm. know. I'm just assuming, right? But how much better do you feel about, like, if you could go up, you could wrestle at 145, 146, 150 pounds. How much better is that for you when you're not cutting, like, massive amount of weight like you were when you were a world team member? Yeah, so so much better because I spent so much time trying to figure out how to make the weight. I don't think it was ever a good weight for me, but I knew I could make the team at it. So I just kind of got stuck there. I tried to go up in 2014 with the plans of being there for three years and making the real run at making an Olympic team. And as soon as I lost, I got third at the open or I got maybe fifth at the open that year and fourth at the trials. And I was like, Nope, don't like losing. I'm going back down. So I went back down in 15, which was even more miserable because I had bulked for a whole year. And I weighed probably 160 at the time trying to make 134, which was uh, just brutal. And uh, I, I mean, it really, looking back these last four years, I've spent coaching. I've gotten so much better as a wrestler uh, because I'm focusing on the things I need to for coaching, but I'm also not cutting weight. I'm not trying to win. There's no pressure on me. And uh, we're going to find out on November 24th. If those, if I'm, if I'm right in that, that theory that I got, I think I've gotten a lot better. So if you win, who, who are you looking at next? Anybody. Or when you win, I should say, right? Anybody. Yeah, okay. Anybody? Right. I'll take if. <laughs> you, you, you call, you're calling someone out you, you, after yeah, the I'll, win? Or? I'll, I'll take anybody that wants to scrap with me. And, and it's such a good, uh, easy choice for these athletes because they don't want to wrestle the best guys mm -hmm. and the guys who they're actually going to have to compete against at the Olympics. So wrestle me. I think I'm still world class. I think I can compete with them for sure. It'll be an interesting challenge for them without having to put it on the line 
and give up some some reads or some tells for for a match that's really going to matter to these guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's no pressure for me. Uh, it, it gives me something to look forward to. It keeps the guys focused. If I'm competing or if Nate Jackson's getting ready to wrestle Bo, Bo Nickel now, he just wrestled in the flow event. It keeps the whole team focused and training towards something. So I'm all about these money matches. And I'm just really excited that everybody else can work out the kinks in putting actual, the actual event on and we just get all the, the benefits of it. So I'm just yeah. super excited for my guys are branding themselves well and it's paying off for us. It's like they're, they're, my athletes are getting paid and they're having something to train for. And the guys who are putting on the event, get their college guys in there and get to do the same thing and get their athletes paid. So, I mean, we're just, we're appreciative of being in the event and we love it. So I'll, I'll be a part of it as much as I can. Okay. So my thing is I'd like to just come watch the workouts. I think I saw a video of you and Boris. It's you and Bor a picture of you and Boris just trained together the other day, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Is that something you recently posted? I'd like to see that matchup, you and Boris Novotkov. I'd like to see you in a B money matchup. Mm -hmm. and I, these are things we could just come watch and watch you train. I, I, yeah. I, I would be into that. But like, if somebody could make one of those matchups happen, I mean, I know that you know, you know, you don't want to become frenemies with these guys, right? But like, those would be great matchups. And I, the workouts are probably incredible because you're going for broke all the time. If I know you, so I mean. Could we see one of those matchups potentially, Reese? I don't know if I would ever wrestle somebody that I coach. You know, I, that's not what we're looking for. There's too many guys out there that I could wrestle against. But I mean, with our with our room, as as often as we wrestle, and Bryce being here a couple months ago, Bryce and Boris and Graf and Suriano and Ashnault and uh, I, I think I'm missing some Belazic. All these guys are in there scrapping every day. And that's why we're, we're getting better. And I mean, hopefully we can get good enough to where I don't have to wrestle anymore some point soon, but for right now, we're, we got a hell of a, a room around 65 kilos. We call it 65 kilo university. Uh, we have like six guys in there all going the same way, which is, is great for being in the room and it builds a lot of competition and people get really ready before practice and, and get really focused throughout the week and then we have the same thing up at 86 kilos with nate jackson and ethan ramos is over at rutgers and cj brucky is a good 79 and he's been doing well he just placed at 86 but he's a he's a true 79 he's a little small for the weight and so uh, man we're we're starting to look at some other people to be fill, filling in around those weights too and so it's like we we're pretty good all the way through the lineup so i can just come watch you guys scrap in the practices Yes, I can just watch come watch the practice and watch the match that for free. Yeah. Oh. All day, every day. Boris I'm and I in. have been going at it all week. It's crazy. The, the situations we get into, cause he's a, he's got a different style. He's got that foreign feel that he'll give up some positions to try and rip your neck off and do high flyer stuff. So I gotta be ready. He's uh, he's giving me all I want right now. It's fun. So, you know, with this, this change, right. It kind of, don't know when the next card is or whatever it may be or who's you know as a coach how do you plan for that or what do you tell your guys or always be ready or kind of or what it, what has changed from your coaching aspect yeah i mean we're always ready we mm -hmm. never stop training this is what we do for a living uh mm -hmm. it's more like when can we take breaks so mm -hmm. it's like uh cj brookie has been training crazy hard because nate keeps having these matches and he's like he needs a break so we'll, we'll give him some time off but these guys they don't take breaks unless i tell them to so they're just kind of always in there and that's how i i am too i never really take any time off unless uh unless they really tell me to we we got to follow some covid restrictions which ends up giving us a few more days off when we travel uh, which which is more than enough for me i i really enjoy being at practice and being on the mats and uh, it's something I look forward to every day. And, and I feel the same for my guys. And so, I mean, I really think that that's why we're doing really well. Our guys really want to be in there and they, they like the process of learning and getting better. You know, this is a really unique position you have. It's two colleges sharing an RTC, right? NJRTC is, is Princeton and it's Rutgers sharing an RTC, right? Yeah. And, and you, you made the move from California to Jersey. You made a coast to coast move and that's normally like a corporate move, not a wrestling coach move. What right. is it like? What was that move? First off, what was the move like from California, Southern California to New Jersey? And, and what's it like having these two really good top 10 programs work together and share you as a coach? 
Yeah, well, Coach Joe Dubuque called me up. Uh, I think he just saw one of my Instagram posts. And another reason why branding yourself well pays off. <laughs> Uh, and then he, he called me and asked me to do the interview. And once I came out, I was like, man, this is the place we have to do this. And my wife, she didn't like California. So it was perfect timing. <laughs> um, so, and she really loves Jersey and my family really loves Jersey. My kids love it here. And uh, it ended up just being kind of the perfect storm of something that worked really well. And I'm basically the middleman in between both programs. They work very well together. It's awkward for maybe one day a year when they duel each other. But they're, they're good friends and they work very well together and they know that it's easier and more efficient to do an RTC together because let's say we have six athletes, we're funding three on the Princeton side and Rutgers funds the other three. And so then we can have a full squad of six of all the Olympic weights. And, uh, and we actually have more than that. We have like more 10 or 11 guys on the whole roster for the RTC, but it's so much easier when you split it down the middle and uh, you split the funding and you have double the training partners. And it's just, it takes a group of guys who can drop the ego and know that this will be better for Jersey and for the RTC. And it's working out really well. Nice. nice. And you said you recently moved and you're in your new studio. Is that what you, what you got going on there? I got the new studio. I got the dollar mats going. I got this thing I just paid for i don't know where i got <laughs> i got my barbarian shirt on with the same logo it's everywhere you gotta brand yourself boys i've been talking about it the whole podcast yeah but uh yeah i got the new studio i do fitness programming video follow alongs here for a company called base blocks i do technique videos out here this used to be in my living room so once again my wife is much more happy i'm out in the garage <laughs> i can actually make some noise and they don't have to be quiet whenever i'm doing videos makes my life a lot easier and my family's life. So it's nice to have this new space, but um, yeah, man, it's going on. Also, I've been doing a, a new ebook coming out. It's called how to become a freak athlete. And what we do is break down all the crazy Humphrey challenge tricks. Me and my old strength coach, Dustin Myers, coach Myers gut check on Instagram. If you want to follow him, we break down all the Humphrey challenges on how to do them. And then we do a strength program on how to develop the muscles necessary to complete the trick. So even if you have no shot at doing it, we have the program to get you to the strength level to be able to do it. And then you can follow the tutorials on how to create or do these own tricks yourself. And uh, it's a really fun project we've been working on. It's going to come out in probably two weeks, hopefully for Black Friday. We've been grinding. Oh, nice. On nice. Black, uh, yeah, we've been really pushing hard to try and get it done. It's been a lot of work, but it's, it's been fun. Yeah. I think that, raising freak athletes, your dad was a world yeah. silver medalist, right? Right. right? And your dad was real, uh, you know, in talking to him, I was in Colorado last year and I talked to him. He lives out in Colorado, I think still. So. Yeah. In Colorado. Yeah. He's in Littleton, Colorado, yeah. right outside of Denver. Yeah. So I went to mile high wrestling club and they rotated at high schools and he showed up and it's just real cool seeing him. But your dad's real, he was like kind of laid back, right? Real uh -huh. laissez-faire approach to things. Yeah, of course. And that's what, no, it's what he said. He's like, hey, you know, like I, I, I was real laid back with my guys. I know that the, the Torellas didn't start wrestling until like eighth grade. I know you guys were always around it, right? You guys were always around it. What is it like now? I, I just watched the video of you and your son doing backflips off of a trampoline, tra backflips on the trampoline, off the trampoline into backhand springs. Right. Your dad raised a freak athlete. It looks like you're, you're on the way. How do you raise a freak athlete? How do, how do you guys get into these positions and how did, how did you learn how to tumble and do the things that you do as an athlete, Reese? I don't know, man. It's not, it's not such a, a science, you know, with raising my kid. Like I think you can definitely teach a, a teenager or an adult to, to go through the motions. But the thing that we focus on is letting it be their choice. My dad, you said I was around wrestling so much. I wasn't. He was in sales throughout my whole entire youth. Like I was never really remembered my dad in the wrestling room coaching. And so like when I started to wrestle, he was never uh, on me. Like I see some of these parents today. Uh, and so I even, I want my boy to wrestle and he goes to practice twice a week. But every time I ask him, do you want to go? And he says, yes, every single time. Uh, and that's, if he ever says no, I won't take him. Uh, and, and maybe there'll be a time where, where I got to put my foot down, but twice a week is not that much. 
But uh, with the flipping, I, I found something that he enjoyed. I showed him with a couple tricks here and there and taught him some technique of the things that I know. And now he's doing literally double backflips, double fronts past me very quickly. And he's addicted to it. He, he flips, I don't know, four or five hours every single day. And so when you get somebody that is interested in something, you'd be shocked at how hard of a worker they can be. And so the, my goal is to get them that fired up about wrestling like my dad did. Uh, Cause I know how much my dad loves wrestling. And I know that that was his main goal to trick me into thinking it was my idea. And he did. <laughs> and so I, I fell in love with wrestling myself and it made it a lot easier for me to really want to push through the really tough moments of cutting weight and doing the second workouts and third workouts and saunas and everything that comes with wrestling. That's not fun. And when it's your choice, it ends up being a lot more fun. And it's just kind of like when I'm coaching now, I love being in the room. It's one of my favorite parts of every day. And uh, that's what I'm trying to instill in my boy and my girl. And she's kind of following in my boy's footsteps and she wants to do the flips and this and that. And it's like when it doesn't come from me telling you what to do, you'd be shocked at the creativity and the work ethic that that your kids can can uh, they impress me with it. Is it a cop a confidence thing? Because if kids flip it around, you know, how do you instill that in a kid, you know, kind of develop that confidence or they just got to do it on their own or. Yeah. I think it comes from me spotting him and okay. like giving, kind of showing him that he won't get hurt in the beginning. Okay. Uh, and once he did his first backflip, then, I mean, he's out there, he's a kid, he breaks, mm -hmm. he lands on his neck and he wakes up. The next right day. Back up. Right. Yeah. No. I'm, and he's like, dad, just do the flip. You can, you'll be okay. And no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> it hurts. He heard Boris the other day. Boris came over and the first thing I do, Boris was in his jeans and his sweatshirt. He sweat through all of it. I didn't know where Boris was. He was out there flipping with Parker for who knows, two hours. <laughs> but hey, is Reese are your is your name and your daughter Reese the same name? Is it the same spelling? No, I'm R E E C E and she's more like like peace. R E A C E. Okay. So just a, a just an A instead of an mm -hmm. E. Right. That's actually really cool, man. I've never actually yeah. heard of that. It's like really yeah. neat. When you see it written, you don't really see Reese because you haven't, I don't, I've never really seen that as a name, but you spell it out like peace sign. It's Reese, right? What is she into? You said that, you know, he's obviously mm -hmm. into the tumbling and doing all the acrobatics and all the madness that, you know, that you kind of got him into and you, you nurtured, but what's Reese into? So she did ballet for a little bit. She wants to do cheerleading. I took her into... When I first got here, we I did a all girls wrestling class, and so I took her into that, and she loved it. When I was doing it, as soon as anybody else was coaching, she was out. I think one little girl was really good and kind of beat her up, and she didn't like that anymore. <laughs> Parker, in the beginning, he was like, "I like it when they throw me down." I'm like, "Oh, okay, you're gonna like wrestling." All right, wait till you start throwing them down. Reese did not like getting thrown down, and so she wants to do more girly stuff, and she dances a lot. She's doing TikTok, <laughs> which is funny. Um, but, uh, yes, yeah, uh, right now it's di pretty difficult with COVID to, to find open gymnastics places, but that's what, uh, she really wants to do gymnastics and, and, uh, she did ballet and dance. And so that's what she's into, man. She's, she's got it going on. She, I can't say no to her. Nice. Nice. So, um, I guess talk a little bit about the, your barbarian, you know, partnership. Cause you know, like all your guys were that and, you know, obviously sporting that and, you know, they've been a pretty gracious host uh, to Zeb and I. And, you know, we just want to hear your take, you know, with Josh. Yeah, well, Josh, he's the man. He's the man. He's helped us uh, a lot. It's been kind of a good partnership we've had because Tyler Graff and Pat Downey were barbarian guys before I had them. Mm -hmm. And then I got them and they both made the world team. So Josh was like he, loving us. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> so and, and he was he was hooking us up with a ton of free gear and we, we promoted them and he, he supported me. And, and uh, I mean, I'll just constantly support the people that I believe in. And he, he makes really quality gear. He's a really good guy. He's around wrestling all the time. He does youth wrestling. He opened his own club recently. Uh, he gives back to, to Downey and Graf a lot. And uh, he made them a ton of different designs for shirts and sold everything i mean it was just a always a really good situation for us to be in so uh, i always try and repay that favor whenever i can and uh, he's been great to the njrtc and hopefully 
He says the same about us, and it's been a really good partnership, man. It's been great. I'm wearing the shirt right now. Look at that. Damn. <laughs> What's on the back? Anything good on the back? I don't think so. Highlight. Oh, yeah, you got it on the back. Yeah. Oh, and it's got the, <laughs> the, the logo, the NGRTC logo, that, that shield. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. Arms. That's really cool, man. Yeah, for uh, sure. Reese, what's the future of RTCs? You know, like you, you, you are, you came up as an athlete to the Ohio RTC, right? In Columbus. Mm -hmm. And then you moved out to California and we're working with, uh, was it Titan Mercury out there, I believe? Yep. And then now you're over here. So you, you've had a long, you, you're into RTCs for over a decade now. What's the future of RTCs? And, and could we see someone like Reese Humphrey, who's like on the front of everything, you know, branding, you understand the business end of things. What's the future of RTCs in your eyes, Reese? Hopefully it keeps going down this path, man. I really like what's going on right now. Uh, USA Wrestling is getting a ton better. I think it's, it's clearly because of the RTC programs. We can train freestyle at a younger age. I mean, the restrictions are getting tighter now, uh, but you can train freestyle with the best guys. I remember my first freestyle match was the open uh, first senior level match was at the open and uh, I, I had never wrestled anybody senior level before that. And, uh, and it just, it, the kids these days, you can see these cadet world champs, Yanni and Dayton fix and all these guys uh, and Gable, they're ready for college right away because of the RTCs. They've had their hands on the best guys in the world, best guys in the country for sure. Uh, way earlier than I had. So the RTCs have just been great for USA wrestling. I hope that, I mean, they've been great for college wrestling as well. And uh, I hope that it keeps, we can keep the funding and we can keep growing wrestling and keep getting freestyle in the hands of these young kids and keep, uh, keep our best athletes in the sport. Um, because it, there was a point in my career where coaching was so much more financially uh, the right move for me to take care of my family. Now it's starting to see like the best athletes, they're getting paid. And they're starting to get famous. And these pro leagues, hopefully, with the money matches, turns into something even bigger. And uh, I mean, I mean, the the possibilities are endless with what wrestling can do. And so, hopefully, we keep growing it. And the more RTCs, the better. And uh, uh, let's keep running it. You're like a really good mentor mentor to these guys. And um, you know, Pat Downey had a rough summer, right? And you stood by the guy, and you were like so gracious to. Whenever people were trashing Pat down, you stood by the guy, which was hard to do. And, you know, Pat's a young guy, right? You were a young guy once. We were all young guys once. and We don't always make the best decisions. What's it like to, like, kind of stand by someone like that who's having a tough time and, you know, try and be the voice of reason to somebody like that who might be, you know, keep shooting themselves in the foot or saying things maybe they don't mean? Yeah, I mean, it was a tough situation for me. Because Pat was one of my best friends, too. And uh, I didn't want to see him go down the road that he was going down and quarantine was not a great thing for him. Uh, when we were focused and we were doing two a days every day, uh, he didn't have any of those problems and he wasn't tweeting crazy stuff. And, uh, and the, I mean, I talked to him a lot and he ended up choosing that his platform was what he wanted it, wanted it to be. And we couldn't really tell him anything. And I just kind of told him, well, the people that signed your check, they can do what they want to do too. And so we ended up having to split ways and, and if you talk to him, we still have a really good relationship and we always did. And I always will stand by him, but uh, the people above me couldn't stand by the things that he was saying. And he was representing two countries or two programs, two colleges with Rutgers and Princeton, and they couldn't stand for it. So we had to end up splitting ways, which was uh, unfortunate for me. I really enjoyed ha having him in the room and the stuff that you see on Twitter. It's like, it's crazy because I, I never thought it was him. Uh, he puts on this front sometimes and uh, I, I don't really understand why he went down that road so many times, but in the room, he was always a positive guy. Loved to listen to me, loved to do technique, loved to wrestle hard and always pushed everybody around him. And uh, it was always a really good thing for us. So yeah, I, I do miss him, but he's doing MMA now. He's in Florida with Mako actually at American top team. And so he's uh yeah, I think he's doing well. I talk to him every once in a while, send him snaps and things like that. But uh, yeah, man, I, I was on. I wasn't too happy when he had to. We had to split ways, but uh, I could only do so much. Being a dad, you know, you obviously uh, like really enjoy being a dad. Your dad enjoyed being a dad. 
you know, being a dad's like an awesome thing. I, I love it more than anything. It's like my favorite thing ever. Right. Um, how do you learn and teach your kids and guide them whenever you see a, a young person like Pat making mistakes? How do you go back and use it as a teachable moment as a dad, you know, cause social media can be poison. You know, that Reese, um, yeah. but you use it as a pretty positive thing, man. Showing all the crazy stuff you and your kid do and workouts and promoting yourself. And it's like, it's a double-edged sword though. It can go the other way really quick. How do you, as a dad advocate to your kids? You said, you know, your daughter's on TikTok, right? right, social right. Media. How do you, how do you keep it a positive thing for your kids and yourself moving forward? Yeah. Well, I mean, I gave my kids access to social media very young and you can like go back to Parker's first post and like things are misspelled. I didn't, I always let him do it. And sometimes it would just like come up on my feed and it would just be like, I love my daddy or something like, I mean, we're talking way back. He's probably like four years old when I first gave him social media. And so I, I monitor it. I make sure that, uh, especially now he's got to have the post be approved by me. And, uh, and I make sure who he's following and, and it's just, it's always been a good positive thing for us. And, uh, and I mean, it, it does keep him motivated and doing flips. And my, my daughter with TikTok, she follows really positive people and they're very uplifting and it, it's all a good thing, but you can kill your brand with a couple tweets, with one tweet, one bad move can get you fired these days. Uh, and with the whole cancel culture stuff. And, and Downey wasn't one tweet and we tried to save him a bunch of times and that was unfortunate, but uh, branding yourself, it comes back to that, how important it is. If you do it in a positive manner, it can turn into camps. It can turn into money. It can turn into your job. Uh, in my case, and this is my full-time job now, it really was over one Instagram post is how I got noticed. And uh, so, I, I mean, I, I monitor my, what my kids do and it's been super positive and it's all good. What, what was right. that Instagram post? You said Dubuque uh, saw it or I mean, what was I don't it? Remember, but he, he brought it up in the phone call. And okay. so maybe it was a couple. He had seen my name a few times and he was like, man, I'm going to give this dude a call. And once we had the interview, it was like, they love me. I love them. And uh, with Princeton guys and Rutgers guys, I saw all of them in a couple of days. I loved the area. It was fall time in Princeton. It was a very awesome time. Like right now, it's beautiful around here. And, uh, and then I brought my wife out. It was a done deal. Okay, I, we, we focused on Reese as a coach, Reese as a dad, Reese as a grown up. I want to talk about Reese as give me your top three matches. Top, I don't know if you want to expand it to five, I don't care because there have been some absolute electric matches that you know, and there's and you don't always win them. So, like, I know that if you want to bring up matches you've won, I don't care. But yeah. what are your favorite matches? Did, didn't you, did you beat Andrew Howe in the state finals? Sure did, crushed him. As, as he was a freshman, you were a senior, right? Yeah, I was. How bad you beat him? I don't know. Seven to one, eight to one, something like that. I headlocked him. I was just nice. throwing the kitchen sink at him. I was nice. that was when I was confident. I I, I did a sea walk out to the mat. <laughs> oh, so does that make you one of your favorite matches then? Sure, it does now. Now that I'm thinking about it. I love it. I love it so much. Um, obviously, Jared and I were talking off camera. And, I, and listen, I know I bring up matches where you lose, but it doesn't mean they're not great matches. Yeah, the Dake match, the Dake match first... was insane, dude. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, I mean, when you brought up my top five, I would have probably first gone to all five. I would have lost. They've all oh. been my favorite ones and because I learned the most lessons from them. And just because my style, like the, the brand highlight Humphrey, I had this kid we were recruiting or talking to, and he was like, I was looking through a bunch of your matches. You did a lot of cool stuff. You didn't win that much. <laughs> <laughs> but even in the ones I lost, I, I almost always did something cool, which is what I'm really going for. <laughs> Winning's cool, but throwing someone on our head is way cooler. The Ruggirello and, match. The Ruggirello right, match, right. I think it's yeah. like the quintessential highlight hump moment if there is one. And then, of mm -hmm. course, Martin losing his mind. Do you remember hearing him or I not? Do. Do you remember? No, no, no. I don't. Oh, so <laughs> that was a, one of my breakout matches, too, because it was tied or he was winning on riding time at the time. And I threw him and I lost a point. And and then I still came back and won. And then I like kind of solidified that I do belong in the top. I was ranked second. I was like, oh, I do belong here. And then, uh, then I really 
tried my best to win the national title that year. I ended up losing to Franklin Gomez, which was a turning point for me too. Uh, it was a really close match at the big 10 finals. I had them like up in the air and ended up like screwing that takedown up. But then in the national finals, he shut down my number one tie and it made me, I, I didn't know what to do. Like took pretty much dominated me uh, in a close match, but dominated me like five to two or something, you know? And it made me realize that I have to grow and take, I need more than one shot. I need more than one tie. I need to learn how to hand fight. And so the, the matches I lose, I, I definitely grew the most. And some of them were my favorite against the Iranian dude twice. I was up 5-0 at the Worlds and uh, ended up losing 8-8 eight to eight or something, or 9-8. to eight. I think if I would have stepped out of bounds instead of just falling down, I would have won. And I didn't realize it because criteria was crazy. And, uh, and I, I just didn't picture it but pay attention to that learn all the rules make sure you know that stuff and then the another match at the world cup where i threw them for five but when i did i got a concussion and i mean i don't remember half the match but all these matches i look back on most of my favorite ones are the, the ones i had to do really cool stuff in and ended up getting to that point where i you both you guys have nothing left and you're just fighting with will those are the ones that i really like and the ones that i think too and then, you know, Dake, I, when I slammed him on his head and, and ended up losing I was telling that. him, I said, you, you, you body locked him and you bombed him. All right. And I remember there was like this crazy scramble and you had his hip turned. Did he bomb you back too? I forget. No, no, I ended up, it's kind of weird because I didn't know I got the takedown. I threw him and he kind of rolled off his back fairly quickly, but they called two. But I had my hands locked around his waist for like 30 seconds after that. And nobody realized it. Wow. They just called stalemate and thought Dake and I have talked about it. I'm like, you know, my hands are lying. He's like, I do know that. I'm like, if you guys would have <laughs> protested, if I would have won, you guys would have won that. We would have had to wrestle the match again in the semifinals, which would have been crazy, right? Wild. Wow. Who did you beat in the semis as a junior? Jason Ness. You beat Ness in the, mm -hmm. and he's a crazy go for broke. Not as much as his brother, but he, he does crazy stuff. I mean, yeah. he, yeah, which I won the national he's title. A freestyler too. He's the only match I've ever lost in Greco. I, I'm not a Greco wrestler, but I won Fargo. I made two junior world teams and I won two university nationals and one far. Yeah. So I've got like three or four national titles in Greco. I've only lost one time ever. <laughs> it was a Jason. Who Steph haven't you practice. wrestled? That's a 65 or a 60 or a 61 or a 66 kilo guy in the world or in America domestically. You've literally wrestled everybody. Yeah, I've wrestled a lot of guys. I've been around for a while. I'm still going. I haven't wrestled. Still going. Right. But you, you did some beach wrestling too, right? I mean, oh, that's you, right. That's that's the uh, the future of wrestling. I really believe it. Josh, these, Josh swears by it. No, dude, Josh swears by it. And if you wrestle it, the rules are great. It's a mm -hmm. takedown is one. A push out is one. If you touch your knee, it's one. And then if you like, I mean, if I lateral drop you and you roll up your back, still one. I have to slam you flat on your back. It's like a pin hmm. and that's the only way to get three. Cause if you're up three Oh, it's over. So, so the rules the tournament, did you win the tournament you're in? No, I end up losing. So these guys wrestle, I lost twice. Uh, I think I kind of got screwed because you do pool play and I lost to the Georgian who ended up one winning. And in my bracket, I thought it was like a veteran thing. I thought I was going to go there. I'm going, <laughs> did you wrestle some I'm going to Rio. I think I was drinking like two oh, or three That's days. right. It was down there. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> on the beach i'm doing a veteran thing this is gonna be great <laughs> i was paying for it i got there and two guys had beaten logan steber in in real freestyle wrestling <laughs> like a, a guy i had in the first round won the u20 won the university worlds i'm like dude what is this <laughs> like all former world team members and then the guys that i lost to ended up getting first and second so i think i could have been top three in the worlds too but it was a uh, it was a really fun experience and i would definitely do it again and i i hope that 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 it becomes a real thing in the olympics and i've actually heard talks that at least women's beach wrestling could be 2024 i don't think men's will happen that quick but uh that might be the only job i would leave this job for beach wrestling olympic coach <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love awesome. it. Oh man. I, I listen, man, I could keep you here all night. I mean, we could talk times square. That was oh. one of my favorite matches, even though you yeah, obviously, yeah. you know, that was a crazy one. I remember talking to you. Remember we talked and you were actually yeah. hanging out in stores. You were was walking, walking through stores, warming right? Up, 
American Eagle. It's a real thing. It's a real thing. People ask some lady asked me a question about what clothes, <laughs> where are the clothes were. I'm just like, lady, I got so much going on. <laughs> Not the time. <laughs> How about that whole thing was so wild with you guys and that, that three man that with you yeah. bunch and, and Coleman was just such a, cause bunch qualified the weight and it was cause nobody had qualified the weight and that's why they had to do that special wrestle off. Right. Bunch qualified the weight and I couldn't go cause I broke my hand. And if you were ranked number one and you had a medical excuse like that, you could sit out of the trials. So I sat out. And I was going to go to China, but Zeke Jones was the coach at the time. He came out and watched me wrestle Steber and Bunch. And I had this like big cast on my hand and I wrestled and I lost to Logan, but I beat Bunch with this cast on my hand. And Zeke was like, yeah, but you can't really wrestle like that. So they sent Bunch, Bunch qualified the weight. I was actually like sitting ready to weigh in and wrestle off Coleman for the chance to go qualify the weight at the next one. And I was like down to weight and bunch. We were watching bunch uh, and he ended up winning the, to get bronze to qualify the weight. And so Coleman and I would just ended up getting to hang out and eat together instead of compete. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wild. That was a really unique thing, man. Being a part of that was, you know, and obviously you didn't make the team, but once again, man, another just crazy unique match. Is that the most unique environment? to, to wrestle in Reese Times Square. Yeah. In New York City. I mean, looking back on I, I loved it when it was first announced, like that's going to be so cool to make the Olympic team in Times Square. And it was really cool for Coleman, but looking back, like warming up in American Eagle, wasn't anything I'm used to. The mats were like on fire because they were in the sun all day. Like I had all these burns all over me when I left and I thought they were mat burns, but they were like actual burns from being so hot on there. And I mean, uh, losing two clinches, is, is not a great feeling. Like I didn't really feel like I lost it at the time. Like clearly those are the rules and we both know that stepping into it. Uh, but I don't know. I feel like I was ready. I made the team in 11. I made the team in 13, beat the same guys. So it's just, uh, it's just one of those things like Olympian isn't really in the cards for the Humphreys. So that, that's fine with me, man. I'm totally cool with being a world team member and being coaching now. So uh, yeah, we're still moving forward. Be trusting. Yeah, beach wrestling, beach of the future, right? Old man, beach wrestling, right? No, but you you touched on you know that the being brought up, you know, not really knowing your dad was involved in the sport. Now, obviously, you know, being a coach, are there coaches you rely on? Do you rely on him or kind of other coaches? You kind of pick their brains, or you know, what's that? What's that talk like with him? Yeah, so I'm talking to my dad every single time I leave practice. Uh, it's I, one first I'm talking about how awesome I was during the practice and then I'm <laughs> then, we, then we get into how uh coaching like what what should my next best move be this guy's doing this I'm having troubles getting through to this guy and he'll talk me through it and then uh I really I I talked to to coach Goodale I talked to Joe Pollard I talked to Dubuque I talked to Nate Jackson who's my athlete but we also talk about him being a coach he's the volunteer over at Princeton and then I think my number one guy that that mentors me the most is coach Ayers uh I I he I love what he does he's turned Princeton from a winless team to a team that was definitely going to be top 10 I think they could have made a push at winning a trophy last year uh they had the team they had the squad to do it and Ayers gets his guys ready better than anybody he's one of the most organized guys he reminds me of uh, Tom Ryan with the way that that people look up to him and with like uh, when he walks in the room, everybody notices. Um, but he's he's uh, he's pushed me in a lot of different ways. A lot of the things that I'm not great at as a coach, he's just the master at. And uh, he holds me accountable. Dubuque holds me accountable all the time. And I mean, I'm, I'm just around so many good guys with the Princeton staff and the Rutgers staff. There's a reason why they're they're top 10 programs and they're they're going to keep moving up. Now they're with the big dogs and now we got an RTC and the recruiting is going to get a, hopefully a little bit easier for them. And uh, I mean, being around this group, how, how can I not keep learning? Who, who's going to be in your corner in two weeks? You know, Ayers, I, Ayers didn't even know I was wrestling. I didn't really tell anybody. I'm <laughs> like still training, you know, as always. Like I'm on a mat all the time. Nothing really changed for me. Uh, but I told Ayers and he was like, oh, I'll go and Dubuque will go. So they're going to coach me and Nate uh next weekend or two weeks from now 
good ale. How often do, is it? Is it every day you're you're communicating with both of these guys? I mean, they're 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 the boss essentially. They're like co bosses of you, right? Who yeah. do you communicate with the most, good ale or airs? All right. So I talk to them both all the time uh, before COVID. Right now, we're not allowed to get into Rutgers, which is just it's a bummer for us. The administration won't let any quote unquote outsiders in, and the RTC is viewed as outsiders. And I get that. Like they don't want one mistake happening one kid to get the virus and then having to shut all the way down because they are back in the facility and princeton we just go with them right now they're off campus they're not allowed near princeton so that makes it easier to let rtc guys in and we can go on our own uh restrictions and guidelines which has been phenomenal we haven't had any issues and uh, so right now, I don't I don't see good ale and the Rutgers guys nearly as much as I'd like to. But I talk to them every single week, like, hey, can we get in this week? And like, no, still not now. And so that's always a not my favorite call. But it's uh, I still look, really look up to to coach good ale and Donnie Prislav and Joe Pollard and all the guys over at Rutgers. And uh, I, I just can't I can't wait till we can get back in there. But right now, I, I definitely talk to the Princeton guys more because I'm in there every day. I just like it's been awesome watching your career now seeing you as a dad and a coach uh, and just watching everything watching you you know grow up from a high schooler to a college guy and covering you has been really awesome. Uh, give us all the handles the social media handles real quick Reese sure. so that we can so, uh, get people. Instagram is highlight Humphrey Twitter highlight hump youtube.com slash highlight Humphrey and then TikTok my most followers somehow <laughs> i don't know how it all blew up on there it's uh it's highlight humphrey it's highlight humphrey and, and how did, what, what's your favorite platform uh i don't know man it, it goes in phases like sometimes i get into twitter sometimes well i was back in i was into tiktok for a little bit it was a lot of fun um that's more like fun with my kids and still doing all the athletic stuff that i've always been doing to to break the monotony of wrestling every day and the grind. You got to do something fun every once in a while. At least I do to keep myself from going insane. Um, but the Instagram is a, a go-to for me too. So I'm, I'm in around all of them. Cool. And the ebook, right, hopefully out on uh black Friday, what an old school great. gym, old school Good. gym. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Nice. Yes, Coach My with Coach Myers. Coach Myers. Yeah. We've been working on it for a while. It's a, uh, it's, probably six months we've been working on this thing and our whole objective is to make enough money to have a big party in vegas <laughs> <laughs> there you go. well you worked uh, with them on the what the ultimate pump and things like yeah, that too right uh, yeah he's he's killing it with the ebooks and so i'm yeah. like dude you can help me out and get me involved he's mm -hmm. he's my boy so he's mm -hmm. he's did you make the, the trip out when he went to cali california or did yeah, you go Muscle yeah. Beach, we did that photo yeah. shoot out there i mean we just we're boys we we used to train every single day. He would drive up the 40 minutes from old school to Ohio State to train me for free three days a week. And uh, wow. yeah, when you're lifting with someone, just us two in the room, we ended up just becoming best buddies. And uh, now we're working together. I see what he's doing. And he knows that I can help him with some marketing stuff. And, and he can help me with the organization and the actual writing of the book and pushing me to learn how to do that process. So hopefully I can do some more things like that. And uh, yeah, been a great friend and a mentor along along all that. And so hopefully we get to Vegas soon. Nice. Do you ever see? Do you ever see the uh, the Johnny to Julius uh, social media post? And if so, did they give you anxiety? Yeah, yeah John, <laughs> I was sweating watching that. But man, he has the coolest Instagram, the coolest TikToks, and he won't blow up. And he just finally did the one where he was holding hands and his boy let him go, and he finally got a couple million views on that. So he's going viral. Well deserved. Everybody should follow Johnny to Julia. Did you see the base jump where he broke his ankle? Yes. Land into that. the, the cliff. The next day. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I saw him when he cut his cast off because he's Johnny. Like this <laughs> Johnny. <dude. Yeah>. What's <laughs> that guy doing? What's he doing? Yeah, he cut it off and he's like limping around the Airbnb we were at. I'm like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> just, where was that? Where were you guys? We were in Boston for Deron Wynn's UFC debut or second fight, I think it was. And uh, we had a whole squad out there. He's at Harvard, so he rolled through. When did he – where was he when he broke his ankle on the cliff? That wasn't in, like, New England. No, I don't know where he was, but uh, I don't know. He was – it was not good. It was a good thing he had a helmet on. 
because he still knocked himself out. He was snoring at the bottom of the cliff. That's not oh a good. Oh my God! What a freak! Got to be freak. kicked there, Johnny. <laughs> oh, it's crazy. All right, Jared. I, I listen. Like I said, we could do it all night. It is right. only the barbarian hour. Uh, yeah. I'm good. Reese, yeah. Thank no. You for, yeah. Thank, thank you, guys. Reese. Yeah. Thank you, guys. It's good to see you, boys. Yeah. Thanks for time, man. All right. See ya. All right, Reese. Take it slow.